Coming up, a detective testifies about a confession to murder as the case of murdered banker Stephen Sherman resumes. A political veteran returns to the front lines ahead, the new FNM senator announced today. And what you're being encouraged to do this breast cancer month, whether the illness affects you or not. The National Report starts now. Now in HD. ZNS Network presents The Bahamas Tonight. This segment of the news is brought to you by BTC, powered by Lime. Good evening, everyone. I'm Keish Latterly. And I'm Candino Knowles. As always, it's good to have you joining us. An alleged assault at a local high school has spurred another investigation. A late afternoon confrontation at the school in southwest New Providence has led to yet another probe into an attack against a teacher on a school campus. In this report, Jiminy Swain tells us why the parent taken into custody was later released and where the investigation stands now. Just hours ago, a parent and teacher reportedly got into a heated exchange that landed that parent in custody. Police are looking into an alleged assault on a school campus today. According to police, a teacher and a parent got into a physical altercation on the campus of the Anatole Rogers High School near the end of the school day today. Now, while the parent was taken into custody at the Kamaika Road Police Station, initially we understand that the police are now investigating a counterclaim of assault by the parent against the teacher. And that has meant that the parent was released from custody pending the outcome of the investigation. Now, while Bahamas Union of Teachers President Belinda Wilson acknowledged the incident, she told ZNS News that she was still awaiting the details of the incident from the shop steward. The episode follows an ongoing feud at the Faith Avenue School. The school year began with the Bahamas Union of Teachers calling for the dismissal of the principal. The Education Minister Jerome Fitzgerald has, however, supported the principal, saying that she would remain in her post. This incident comes on the heels of an arrest and subsequent conviction of a parent in Grand Bahama who assaulted a teacher on that island and is now serving time. Jiminita Swain, ZNS Network News. Well, despite the United States government shutdown that started at midnight, operations at the local U.S. Embassy continued as normal. The shutdown has affected more than 800,000 U.S. federal employees and will cost the Obama administration $1 billion a week. In a statement issued this morning, embassy officials confirmed that all embassy services, including consular services, both to the United States citizens and visa applicants, and port of entry operations at both the Nassau and Freeport International Airports continue as normal. Foreign Affairs Minister Fred Mitchell, who is in New York this week, says he doesn't foresee any immediate impact from the shutdown. My feeling here is that all of the essential services connected with the conduct of U.S. government uh, matters across the world will continue. And so I would expect that there'd be minimal impacts on the foreign service of the United States government, uh, because I would think that most of those services are considered essential. And, of course, uh, one of the things that affects the Bahamas is the fact that air traffic control over a certain uh, height in our airspace is actually controlled by the uh, United States Federal Administration Authority. And um, um, from my reading, there's not going to be any impact upon that. Now, Minister Mitchell says that Foreign Affairs has not been notified of any potential impact by the United States Embassy. The minister who's acting for me is uh, Sir Davis, and I know that uh, yesterday uh, they had a meeting with the um, with the charge uh, of the United States in the Bahamas, but that had to do with uh, a statement to be made on Syria, uh, and so uh, the, the issue of the uh, of the shutdown did not, uh, from the minutes that I saw, did not arise in that meeting. Now, the U.S. government, as we've said, has undertaken a temporary shutdown after the two houses of Congress failed to agree on a new budget. The Republican-led House of Representatives insisted on delaying President Barack Obama's health care reform, dubbed Obamacare, as a condition for passing the bill. More than 800,000 thousand federal employees face unpaid leave with no guarantee of back pay once the deadlock is over. Today, ZNS News took to the streets and talked to a few American citizens and federal employees about this issue. 
if they start cutting their own wages as far as the president on down maybe it would trickle on down and benefit the all of the United States period instead of all the jobless homeless hungry that we have going on in the states government should have stayed out of all of this to begin with and let Americans handle it on their own you know I don't believe in socialized medicine at all if you work hard you're successful you work for a big company then you know you should be able to get the insurance that you pay for and if you don't want to work then you don't get insurance that's the bottom line congressmen should pay better close attention to what the people want and just work out a deal according to what we want and what they know we want I think right now what they're doing is they're just trying to get their own personal agendas out and, and I think that's harmful to the country obviously. Hostage for political reasons in the sense that Congress can't agree on something and so they don't let us work and this has implications for us in terms of our everyday debts. Uh, it does create hardship. So. Needless to say, no federal worker is overjoyed about all of this. A police detective told jurors during the Renee Sherman, Cordero Bethel, and Ginaldo Farrington trial today that one of the accused allegedly confessed to killing banker Stephen Sherman last year. Our foreign carry has been following this case and has the latest. A police detective testified Tuesday that 22-year-old Ginaldo Farrington admitted during a police interview that he killed 47-year-old banker Stephen Sherman last February. The detective said Farrington told him that he went to the Yamacraw area after speaking to another person and when he got there, he met Stephen and another person in a yard. The officer said Farrington told him that he made the banker get on the ground and then shot him in the back of the head, later fleeing the scene in a waiting vehicle. However, during cross-examination, Farrington's attorney, Maria Desil, challenged the officer's testimony, suggesting that Farrington was placed in a room at CDU with about six officers beaten and forced to sign the statement. But the detective rejected the suggestion, saying that it never happened. Desil also asked the officer if he asked Farrington if he wished to have a lawyer present during the interview, and the officer said the question was not put to Farrington, however it was explained to him. Among those testifying was Detective Buford King. He told jurors that he and other officers arrested Ginaldo Farrington for murder. King said after arriving at a duplex apartment off Calpin Road, he discovered Farrington lying face down in the hallway. He then arrested and cautioned him. Meantime, Farrington is accused of conspiring with Condero Bethel and Renee Sherman to kill Renee's husband last February. Farrington and Bethel are also charged with murdering the financial executive and robbing him and a female relative, while Renee Sherman is facing a separate charge of aiding and abetting in the crime. They have all pleaded not guilty to the charges. Vern Carey, CNS Network News. Now that initial charges have been levied against five Defense Force Marines, in the coming weeks they'll face a disciplinary hearing defending themselves against claims of abuse from Cuban detainees at the detention center. Attorney representing the men, Wayne Monroe, provided some insight on what penalties the men could face if convicted. The, I think for most of the offenses, and I just got the material on Friday, the top level um, punishment is confinement of two years or some such thing. Curiously, the penalty for them permitting the Cubans to escape, if they had, is also two years imprisonment. Now, while Monroe says he was impressed by the manner in which Marines handle their job, he is uneasy about a few things. The only thing that troubles me is whether or not these professional soldiers have the support that they need to feel comfortable in discharging their duties fully. We don't seem to appreciate always that four of them died in an engagement and you never know when, and they never know, when we will call on them to die for us again. But that's their job. Now, National Security Minister, the Honorable Dr. Bernard Nottage, also weighed in on the hearing. He talked to reporters today about the closed-door inquiry. Have the matter investigated. We can have the inquiry done. Because what we want to do is to ensure the Defense Force is run consistently with international regulations, that we have the right uh, mix of persons in place to administer it and to manage it, and that we minimize any future um, 
attempts either at escape or having to deal with, with such matters. Now, meantime, the National Security Minister with responsibility for government business and House of Assembly also told reporters what they can expect when Parliament resumes in the morning. The government is preparing a number of legislative initiatives, uh, things that we think have to be done. We have to have some amendments to the Criminal Procedure Code. We have to deal with some festering issues like the cash for gold type of offenses. Um, we've got to <clears throat> deal with some of the social issues and you are aware of what they are. Uh, protection of our children, uh, protection of our women. Um, uh, we have to deal with uh, some of the major offenses like armed robberies. In fact, this week, what we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to church. You know we need church, eh? Um, but it's the 284th anniversary of the Parliament, September the 29th. That's, the, that's yesterday. And, and uh, we're going to go to church. Uh, we hope to go to St. Agnes Church uh, on Wednesday to commemorate that and to give God thanks for um, what he's doing for us as a country. The Senate has adjourned sine die, but when proceedings resume, members of the upper chamber will meet a new face, which will lead the Free National Movement Senate team. FNM and opposition leader Dr. Hubert Minnis announced today that former cabinet and education minister Carl Bethel will assume the role of leader of opposition business in the Senate. He replaces former Senator Desmond Bannister. Bethel, a familiar face, has a decorated political career, one Dr. Minnis believes makes him the best candidate. We are more than confident that with his years of experience in the political arena, he will contribute significantly to the Senate's proceedings and objectives. And as a veteran politician, opposition leader Dr. Hubert Minnis believes Mr. Bethel's experience will lend greatly to the development of the free national movement and by extension the country. In fact, Dr. Minnis says as his party aims to build an opportunity-based society, Mr. Bethel will play a pivotal role in shaping legislation, policies, and programs. But that's not all. His understanding of the judicial system in the Bahamas will enable him to lend critical advice to the government as they seek to improve the administration of justice in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And as Mr. Bethel gets set to re-enter the halls of Parliament, he will step down from the Constitutional Commission on which he currently serves. The country, he says, requires a mature national consensus on the best way forward during these uncertain economic times. As he prepares for his new role in the country's development, he called for multi-partisan governance as the country continues to face a number of challenges including crime and unemployment. None of these challenges can effectively be dealt with without bipartisan, indeed multi-partisan contributions, both from the two major political parties, as well as business interests, organized labor, and the wider civil society. It is in this spirit of bipartisanship that I have agreed to answer this call to service. And while the FNM continues to rebuild from its crushing defeat in 2012, Mr. Bethel says his primary hope is to assist the party's leadership in renewing the party by attracting the next generation of leaders. Younger men and women who will rise and go to the forefront and take up the mantle of national leadership. Yes, to help our new leadership in reinvigorating the free national movement at every level and in every constituency throughout the length and breadth of our Bahama land. It is only through the infusion of idealism and the visions of a new generation that the party will reclaim its relevance and restore the trust of the Bahamian people. Well, opposition leader Dr. Hubert Minnis is still denouncing the government's proposed July 1st implementation of its proposed value-added tax as unrealistic. In fact, the government promised a massive and aggressive campaign on the proposed tax before the end of September. However, that's not happened. The Free National Movement will analyze the entire process. We'll analyze different tax systems and we will come out and make recommendations that we think are best for the Bahamian people. But we would not throw anything down anybody's throat and we would ensure that after our analysis we'd have a proper educational process. 
Now, outside of holding town meetings, Dr. Minna says there's more to be done in order to properly educate the masses. The messenger must know what message he or she is trying to convey. If you were at any of the recent town meetings, the town meeting, for example, in the West, were by the technical, the professionals, members from Ministry of Education and Ministry of Finance, you would have noted that many questions that were put forth to them, they could not answer. And therefore, there's still not a proper understanding of what they're doing. So how can they teach you that they themselves don't understand? That's the blind leading the blind. Now, while not commenting officially, State Finance Minister Michael Alkita said the attack by the FNM leader is insulting to the men and women who are hard or working hard, that is, toward the implementation of value added tax. In our first look at weather, Tropical Storm Jerry continues to meander in the far eastern Atlantic, but outside of our studios, we have mostly cloudy skies, temperature 82 degrees, relative humidity quite rich at 83%, your winds are light and variable, barometric pressure 1,015.3 millibars, that's 29.98 inches, and it is rising. But stay tuned, temperatures around the following violence, travel and boating forecast is still to come. Well, still ahead, what you should know in order to dodge breast cancer. And Junkanoo Fever is on. We'll tell you how the JCNP is preparing. This portion of the news is brought to you by Shell Helix Ultra. Performance you can see.